Uh, thank you to Larry, thank you to uh, Mayor Giuliani for being such staunch supporters. Uh, it's great to be in a room of friendlies. Uh, it's been quite a ride for the last 15 weeks. Um, what I'd like to do this morning, um, you heard from Larry what I specialize in. Uh, I look at irregular warfare. I try to help our operators understand the enemies, enemies we face, like Al-Qaeda, like ISIS. Uh, now I'm in a national security position uh, inside the White House, uh, working on these issues at the strategic level. Uh, let me give you a brief overview of what we inherited at 12 o'clock on January the 20th, and then uh, what we intend to do, or what the president intends to do, and then we'll leave some time for questions and answers. So, the world today. The sad reality is that wherever you look, pick any compass point on the compass, any cardinal point, we inherited a world on fire whether you look to Asia, whether you look to Europe, whether you look to the Middle East, the last administration created a vacuum. And it wasn't an accident. In the national security strategy, which is the highest unclassified expression of an administration's foreign policy plans, the Obama administration actually opened that document with a letter from the president stating that our policy now is strategic patience. Strategic patience means America doesn't act. America sits back and allows others to act. And I'd like to ask you a question. If you look at the world as it is today, which other country would you like to be shaping the world environment, if not the United States of America? Would you like it to be Iran? Would you like it to be Russia? Would you like it to be China? Would you like it to be North Korea? We facilitated, as a nation, for the last eight years, the creation of numerous vacuums around the world, vacuums that were filled most often by actors who do not have our interests as a nation close to their heart and do not believe in the eternal truths that we hold to be true and upon which the Republic was founded. As a result, we inherited a firestorm. One metric to indicate the challenge the magnitude of what we inherited. The United Nations, hardly a crypto-conservative organization, has done the research and has publicly stated that today, as you sit here, there are 65 million refugees in the world. 65 million. Why is that important? Because that is a world's historic record. We have never had 65 million refugees in human history, not even in 1945 at the cessation of hostilities that were World War II, which saw 60 million people killed, not even then, after the, the Holocaust, the death camps, the war in uh, Asia, not even then did we have that many refugees. But we do today. And it's not just about refugees. Think about what else is happening. As we sit here comfortably in the capital of the most powerful nation on God's earth, right now, as you are drinking your coffee, eating your bagel, there are women and children being sold as sex slaves. Right now, today in slave markets being run by the Islamic State. That's the reality. That's the challenge. But now we have a commander-in-chief who takes that responsibility incredibly seriously. And in just a scant 15 weeks, we have turned things around. But let me focus on just one threat so you understand the enormity of the situation. And that threat is the Islamic State 
which our president has vowed not to degrade, not to ameliorate, but to obliterate. Language is important. And President Donald J. Trump will not countenance political correctness or political distortion of reality. Remember who this man is and was. Not only is he a patriot, not only does he love our armed forces and what this nation stands for, he was a success, and not just a success, an incredibly successful businessman in the world's toughest market, New York real estate. Right, Larry? Pretty tough market. <laughs> As such, he is a pragmatist, a patriot and a pragmatist combined. And as a result, he looks at the world as it is, not as he would wish it to be. That was the last eight years, distorting reality to fit a preconceived notion of what the world should be like. So let's focus on the most serious terrorist threat to the United States, and that's the Islamic State. I'm just going to walk through very quickly three or four um, yardsticks that will help you uh, internalize just how very serious this threat is to America and why the president has made it his primary mission to destroy Number one, the Islamic State is unique amongst threat groups. Why? because it is the world's first ever trans-regional insurgency. The world's first ever. Now let me unpack that. That's a technical designator, but it's an important one. Uh, we now know, it's out there in the open source, that the Islamic State in multiple countries. Yeah? Holds territory in Syria, Iraq, not only that, it has affiliates, according to the National Counterterrorism Center. This is unclassified. It now has fully operational, quote, fully operational affiliates in at least 19 nations around the world. These aren't people who say, ISIS, you're cool. Okay? These are fully operational sub-affiliates. Now, let's take a little bit of a historical perspective to that. Maybe we have some amateur historians in the room. Go back the last 117 years and pick any insurgency in modern history, any insurgency, whether it's Mao in China after World War II, whether it's uh, the FARC in Colombia, whether it's the Mao Mao, and just ask yourself one question. In each of those cases, it doesn't matter which one you pick because the answer will be the same. What was the strategic objective of the insurgent group? What did they wish to achieve? It's always exactly the same thing. They are in an irregular warfare uh, conflict against a specific government. Mao wanted to take down the Kuomintang, the nationalists, and take over China, which he successfully did. The FARC in Colombia wished to take down the elite in Bogota and replace the Colombian government with a so-called Bolivarian Republic representing the true people of Colombia. But in every single case, whichever insurgent group you choose, it's always the same objective. Replace the one government that they are fighting. Now contrast that to ISIS. It's not about one government. It's about all governments. And it isn't just rhetoric. It's actually happening on the ground. We are making their life far more difficult for them, thanks to the great work of people like General McMaster, Secretary Mattis, and others. But think about what they have achieved in a scant six or seven years. They've captured and held territory in multiple countries of the Middle East, as we already know. But not only that, their affiliates have also captured and held territory in other countries. You may have heard of the organization Boko Haram in Nigeria. Boko Haram is a black African jihadi group. Uh, its name is a combination of African and Arabic. Boko Haram literally means books forbidden, Boko Haram, but it means Western education forbidden. Yes, it's an anti-Western jihadist group. A few years ago, Boko Haram 
swore bayat, swore allegiance to the Islamic State and to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. They'd done that before and had been ignored, but this time somebody was listening to them in Mosul or Raqqa. And the Islamic State actually accepted their oath of allegiance to the new caliph and the new caliphate. Subsequently, Boko Haram changed their name. And names matter. They are no longer Boko Haram. Nobody should, in fact, call them Boko Haram. They now call themselves the Islamic State Province of West Africa. Now, you may have zero, you know, to do with kind of terrorism, but it doesn't matter. Just think about that for a second. A jihadi group in West Africa now calls itself the West African Province of the Islamic State which is based in Iraq and Syria. We have never seen this before in human history. We have never seen a threat group that actually spans not only multiple countries, but multiple regions. That by itself means it is not a JV team, it means it is a tier one threat to America and to our friends, our allies, and our partners. Second, um, Boko, uh, the Islamic State, ISIS, is just very impressive when it comes to what we call the first line of operation in an insurgency, which refers to mobilization or recruitment. The most important thing for any insurgency is recruitment. This is what separates a terrorist group from an insurgency. A terrorist group is 12 guys you know, with a rusty 1911 and a box of hand grenades. Yes, this is the IRA, Baden Meinhof, Weatherman Underground. That's a terrorist group. An insurgency has mass, has lots of trigger pullers, has the capacity to move in daylight and capture territory. Well, ISIS has that capacity. But how did it do that? It did that by recruiting tens of thousands of fighters. I'm not talking about sympathizers. I'm not talking about people that send a little bit of money to ISIS. I'm actually talking about active frontline fighters. Again, all of this is unclassified. In the last five or six years, uh, ISIS has recruited more than 85,000 active jihadists. More than 85,000 active jihadists. That's impressive by itself, but let's break it down even further. Of the 85,000, at least 36,000 are what the FBI calls foreign fighters, meaning people who are not from the war zone. They're not from Iraq or Syria. They have been recruited from the outside. That's very impressive because it's relatively easy to recruit somebody who's at home and angry that somebody's come into their backyard. Yes? This is, you know, what my friend David Kilcullen wrote a book on. He called it The Accidental Gorilla. When you're an Afghan tribal leader and there's some foreigners running around your country, it's easy to get angry and pick up an AK. But to travel from Tunisia to Syria, that's a different whole level of commitment. To travel from Indonesia to Iraq as a fighter, that's impressive. And almost half of their, their fighters are not from the actual war zone. But it gets worse. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a Hungarian ethnically. Um, I don't know if you know anything about Hungarians. Hungarians are genetic pessimists. <laughs> I can depress you all day, okay? Okay, so get ready. But I work for a man who solves problems, so I'm here to set the stage and then the, the boss can fix it. Okay, um, so of the 36,000 plus foreign fighters, if you break that down, and this is from uh, unclassified testimony by Director Comey uh, uh, in, uh, on the Hill, of the 36,000, at least, and this is a low, a low figure, at least 6,000 are Westerners, are Westerners, Brits, Germans, Americans who have freedom of movement on Western passports. Maybe some of them are part of the visa waiver program. This is disturbing. Because 
we will be effective. We will crush, and as the president said, we will obliterate ISIS in theater with our partners. But you never catch all of them, and you never kill all of them. And some of them will go home, and they will go home with skill sets they've learned that will make them very dangerous. Let me link this all back to here. You may think, you know, this is stuff happening in Mesopotamia, who cares? But let me bring it all back home. Is anybody familiar with what Omar Mateen, the Pulse Club shooter, said to the 9-11 dispatcher on the night that he killed 49 Americans in Orlando? This is the largest terrorist attack in US history since 9-11. In the middle of that massacre, Omar Mateen went to the restroom put down his rifle and dialed 911. Not to call ambulances to the scene to save the people he had shot, but on the contrary, to make a statement to the dispatcher. That statement, you, you can actually now read, you can actually think, you can access the original audio. The Obama administration tried to censor it. They did actually censor it until the then Attorney General got in trouble for changing the words on the transcript. Let me tell you what that jihadi really said. Omar Mateen, standing ankle deep in blood, said four times to that dispatcher, I am a jihadi. I do what I do for the new caliph. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who is the head of the Islamic State. So what I'm talking to you about isn't theoretical things 8,000 miles away. It is linked intrinsically to the threat here in America. You all know the San Bernardino killers swore by us, swore allegiance on social media to Abu Bakr as well. So this is not something theoretical not something hyperbolic. It's connected to the safety of everybody in this room. Let's talk about the context of what ISIS has achieved. Again, making it unique. It's easy to make fun of the bad guys. Much of the left-wing media will not even use the word caliphate They'll just poo-poo the concept that there is something called the Islamic State, that it's a state and that it's Islamic, yeah? But let's look at what actually happened on June 29th, 2015. When Mosul fell to just a handful of ISIS fighters, very soon after, about two weeks later, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, walked into the Grand Mosque of Mosul, walked up the stairs of the pulpit and dressed in the, the black clerical cloak of the ulama and wearing a black turban, he made a statement, a very eloquent statement, where he declared that as of that moment, the Islamic State, the caliphate, had been reestablished and he was the new caliph. Now, why is this important? Well, let's look at that word caliphate. Caliphate isn't some crazy idea dreamt up by a jihadi in a cave somewhere in South Asia. The caliphate was a real entity for over a thousand years, first founded in uh, the Hijaz, the Arabian Peninsula in the 600s, headquartered out of Mecca. Then its headquarters moved to uh, Damascus at the height of its power, the caliphate was run out of Baghdad. What was the caliphate? The caliphate was the, literally the theocratic empire of Islam, an entity that melded uh, religion with politics and spanned a massive um, expanse of territory in North Africa, the Middle East, and even into Europe. Uh, one metric I, I like to remind people, at the height of the caliphate's existence, remember parts of Spain were part of the caliphate, at the height of its size, 
the caliphate of Islam was larger than the Roman Empire had ever been. Larger than the Roman Empire had ever been. So the caliphate was real and had been for more than a millennia. In fact, at the beginning of the 20th century, the caliphate still existed. It wasn't run by Arabs out of the Middle East, and we didn't call it the caliphate. But the Ottoman Empire was the latest iteration of the Islamic Empire. And even at the beginning of the 20th century, there was an old man, a little old man with a long white beard, who was the caliph of all Muslims. But what happened to the Ottoman Empire? The Ottoman Empire, in 1914, put its money on the wrong horse and thought that the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans would win World War I. And when they didn't, they were in trouble. So in 1918, they had to face the fact that they were on the wrong side of that war. So what did they do? They didn't want to be cut up into little pieces like the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So a very charismatic, handsome Ottoman officer called Mustafa Kemal came up with the answer. He decided the only way we can survive as a polity, as a nation, is to convince the winners of World War I, including us, America, that we are now on their side. We want to join their club. We are now going to be a Western nation. That man, of course, became none other than Atatürk, the head of the new Republic of Turkey. But it wasn't just a question of changing the labels on the door, you know, remove Ottoman Empire, Republic of Turkey. No, it was much, much deeper. As you all know, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who was a Muslim, said to all his fellow Muslims, look, we can practice our faith, that's fine. But that's a private issue. That's what you do at home five times a day. That's what you do in the mosque on Friday. But religion can have nothing to do with politics or the governance of this country. Just as the founding fathers separated church and state, I am going to separate mosque and state. And that is what Mustafa Kemal Atatürk did. But to make sure that everybody understood his commitment in 1924, he officially dissolved the caliphate. The emperor was given his pink slip, literally. And that's when history changed. Because a lot of people had issues with that. A lot of people that had a fundamentalist interpretation of the religion thought, what, what, what just happened? An old army guy with no theological credentials just fired the emperor and dissolved the empire. This is haram. This is forbidden. This is wrong. And there was instant pushback across the Muslim world by extremists and fundamentalists. And one of the most important things that resulted less than five years later in the Suez region of Egypt was, of course, the establishment of an organization you've all heard a lot about lately, the Ikhwan Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood was established with the express purpose, don't take my word for it, Google its founding documents. Read the founding charter of Hamas, which is a chapter of the Muslim Brotherhood. The express purpose of this organization and its offshoots is to reestablish the caliphate that was unjustly dissolved by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. It was wrong to separate Islam from politics, and the only way that we should live is in a theocratic caliphate. That's history. That's indisputable. What happened for the next 90 years from 1928 onwards? Literally hundreds of jihadist organizations were established following the Muslim Brotherhood's creation. And every single one of them, Al-Qaeda included, Egyptian Islamic Jihad, hundreds of organizations across the earth, tried desperately to reestablish that theocratic reality, to bring back the caliphate. But what happened? Every single one of them failed for almost a century until June 29th, 2015 where one organization didn't talk about recreating the caliphate, they simply went ahead and did it. And that's ISIS. And that's why ISIS is the opposite of a JV team. It is the most successful jihadist organization since the caliphate was dissolved. Last point, 
on why ISIS is special, and that has to do with its narrative. It's an awful word. I hate it. DC loves these words and gloms on and then overuses them. The message, if you will, the bumper sticker of ISIS must be understood because that too is different from all the other jihadi groups. There is a core narrative to the jihadism of the last 90 years. It's based upon key writers. If you're really interested, uh, you can Google these people. Syed Qutb, Q-U-T-B, a founding uh, author of the Muslim Brotherhood, laid the stage in the 1950s, Q-U-T-B, Syed Qutb. Uh, then we have uh, key individuals such as Hassan al-Banna himself, al-Banna, the, the founder of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. We have uh, Zawahiri, the current head of al-Qaeda, um, and uh, the most important of all is a man called Abdullah Azam, A-Z-Z-A-M, Abdullah Azam. He was the true creator of the pre-al-Qaeda and bin Laden's boss and spiritual guide. These individuals laid the groundwork, uh, and, and this, the stunning thing is all the bad guys of significance have read their works. We've captured you know, these documents on high-value targets in every theater. So Azam, Qutb, Zawahiri, there is a plan. The most dangerous thing we can do is to say the enemy is crazy and they have no plan. Wrong. The enemy has a strategy, and that's why they have been so effective. But one interesting thing was um, that ISIS put a, a special spin on their message. For 90 years, the, the, the narrative was always the same. Uh, we are purifying Islam. The West has declared war on us, whether it's through colonialism, whether it's through free markets, whether it's through blue jeans, what have you. Yes, we, we are in a defensive jihad. We're just responding. And we must purify the world, and we must reestablish the caliphate. That was a core message for all of these organizations. But ISIS took that and added one crucial addendum. If you read the prophetic scripture of Islam, like any religion, uh, Islam also has eschatology. It has um, a story of end times. Every religion, whether you're a Christian, a Jew, a Zoroastrian, you, the religion has stories, prophetic tales about how the world will end. And Islam, in close parallel to Christianity, has an eschatology to do with a final judgment day, uh, a series of battles between believers and unbelief. And the specificity of Islamic prophecy is a geographic specificity. The Islamic State, remember for two years we had a food fight inside the Beltway, should we call this ISIS or ISIL? Do you remember this, right? The president, President Obama said ISIL, Levant, yes. And everybody else said ISIS, Syria, yeah. Well, it's interesting, that food fight was actually non-existent because both names were wrong. When you have a new enemy and you wish to understand them, um, what do you call them? Do, does your intelligence unit open the drawer of unused threat labels and pick one? <laughs> of course not. Right? When we fought the Third Reich, we called them the Third Reich, not because we believed in a you know, pure Aryan, millennium-long a future empire? Of course not, because they call themselves the Third Reich. During the Cold War, you know, we called the Second Red Army the Second Red Army, not because it was the second thing our intel people counted that day, but because that's what they call themselves. You call, you know, communists call themselves communists, so we call them communists. Yeah. So what did this group call itself? Well, if you go to the Arabic, it's very interesting. ISIS originally called itself the Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham, S-H-A-M, or double A, if you prefer, Al-Sham. Now, what is Al-Sham? If you look it up in an Arabic dictionary, you will find that it refers cartographically to the Greater Levant or to Syria. That's where we got those acronyms. But that's a small part of what Al-Sham means. Sham, in Islamic prophecy, is the equivalent of the Christian Megiddo. Sham is the site that is said to be the location of the last jihad against the kufr, the infidel. If you know your book of Revelation, if you know your Christian eschatology, Christians are taught what? Before Judgment Day and the Second Coming, 
there will be a series of mighty battles, and the most important one will happen in Megiddo, the plains of Megiddo. Megiddo is a town in northern Israel. It's where we get the English word Armageddon. Yes, Armageddon comes from the city of Megiddo. Sham and the city Dabik, which is the name of the ISIS magazine, again, not a coincidence. Sham is the territory of where the last holy war will occur before all people are resurrected and judged by Allah. So let's stop there for a second. When ISIS gets up on Twitter, Telegram, and all the other Facebook or social media platforms and posts more than 55,000 social media postings every day and says, we are the Islamic State of Al-Sham, what is the message they're sending to that young man in his mom's basement, to that immigrant in San Bernardino? What is the message they're sending? Hey, look at who we are. We haven't just named ourselves after the territory in which the last war with the infidel will, will occur. Uh, we've actually captured it. Which means what? What's the implicit message? This isn't just any old jihad. This isn't, you know, fighting the Serbs in Bosnia. This isn't fighting the Indians in Kashmir or the Soviets in Afghanistan. This is the last one. I'm a child of the Cold War. I grew up under the Cold War. I miss it immensely. <laughs> it's much easier. And we always used to talk during the Cold War of what? When the balloon goes up. Do you remember? Yeah? October 62, we really thought the balloon was going up. The message from ISIS is, the balloon is up. Because we're in sham. This is the last one. And it is my conviction that this is the only way to explain more than 85,000 jihadis recruited in just a few years. Because they're using eschatology. They're using end times. They're using themes that for the last eight years it was prohibited to discuss inside federal government. I can tell you, because I was at those academies, I was teaching the FBI, and I was a hostage to those politically correct policies of the Obama administration. That has ended at 12.01 on January the 20th, because I think you can tell that the current commander-in-chief is not a great fan of political correctness. <laughs> so, um, before I start for some questions, um, what's the road ahead? What's the road ahead? Um, three things. I outline them in my book. Uh, you can compare them to what's going on today. First thing is excise political correctness from our threat assessment. I think you can tell that's already happening. Uh, week three of the administration, uh, I had a tier one operator who's on detail to the NSC come up to me and say, you have no idea just how much we already feel unshackled because we are now allowed to do our job. We're not under the mesh, under the, the restraint of politically, ideologically uh, constrained limitations. The president wants us to do our job, and we understand that. So morale is skyrocketing, not only inside the armed forces, but also inside DHS. Uh, Secretary Kelly is doing a fine job. So number one, truth. You can't diagnose an illness unless you're allowed to talk about the illness. And when a jihadi says, I'm a jihadi, you can't say, no, he's just unemployed. Okay. So we're talking truth to the problem. Second, and you've seen the president do this incredibly in the last 15 weeks, we have to help our friends win this war. The president is not an interventionist. Anybody who thinks 59 cruise missiles is the same as 160,000 troops deployed to the Middle East has no idea what they are talking about. The president has said explicitly, I am not interested in invading other people's countries and occupying them. This is not a neocon stealth administration. The president understands that you help a man to learn how to fish. You don't give him a fish. And we are here to help our friends, our partners in the Middle East, fight their wars for themselves. We do not wish to be on the front line because they have to win this war. But we will help them. We'll support them, provide training, intelligence as required. But look at what we've done already. Just look at the body language from the summitry with King Abdullah of Jordan, with President Sisi of Egypt. They understand America is back. No more leading from behind, which itself is an oxymoron, right? How can you lead from behind? That's called following, okay? 
America will lead and will help others fight their own wars. But lastly, and this goes back to the Cold War, what's the long-term victory? You don't, uh, Churchill was right, you never go to war, you never deploy one soldier unless you know what it is you wish to achieve, unless you've defined the peace that will follow. Ultimate victory is not killing all the terrorists, yes? Body bags are not a good metric of success. That was a bad metric during Vietnam. It is not a good metric today. We can kill you wherever you are, right? If, if we have that HVT's coordinates and the local nation and everybody else is, you know, copacetic, we can find you. We did it with bin Laden, yeah? But stacking them like cordwood, as a certain unit says, is not the ultimate measure of success. Why? Because we can kill one jihadi, but what happens when the next day 20 people volunteer to replace him? The most charitable description I gave for the last eight years or last 16 years is exquisite whack-a-mole. Right? But it's whack-a-mole. So how do we win? Not by killing all the bad guys, but by making people not want to become jihadists. That's how we win. How do we do that? Take a leaf out of the Gipper's playbook, okay? We won the Cold War on November the 9th, 1989, without firing one shot. Think about that for a second. We had thousands of nuclear warheads on either side, massive arrayed forces in NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Not one AK, not one M16 was fired across Checkpoint Charlie that cold November night. How did we win? Because we spoke truthfully about the enemy. The president said, tear down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev. We undermined the ideology of the enemy elite. We made communism look like a hollowed out, dead, total failure. And then the people on the other side took the wall down. It wasn't GIs, it was East Germans with little pickaxes that took it down. That's how we won. And that's what we have to do today. We have to destroy the credibility of the jihadi ideology by supporting our Sunni allies. They are the greatest victims of this war. Just look at the figures. Yazidis have been crushed. Christians have been persecuted, of course. But by far, the greatest number of victims in this war are our Sunni partners, killed by the tens of thousands. America needs to understand that there is a connective tissue between the fascists of World War II, the communists of the Cold War, and the enemy we face today. And that connective tissue is very simple. All three of them are totalitarians. You couldn't negotiate with Hitler, you couldn't negotiate with Brezhnev, and you can't negotiate with these people, because they all have one thing in common. Either you agree with them, or they will enslave or kill you. Same with Hitler, same with Khrushchev, same with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. We will have won when the black flag of jihad is as repugnant around the world as the red, white, and black swastika of the Third Reich. That's how we will win, and with the current president in office, we will win. Thank you.